Inside the Mind of Jeffrey Dahmer, A Chilling Exploration of the Notorious Serial Killer Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer, born on May 21, 1960, and passing away on November 28, 1994, is infamously known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster. He was an American serial killer and sex offender whose heinous crimes shocked the nation. Over a span of 13 years, from 1978 to 1991, Dahmer committed a series of gruesome murders that involved the killing and dismemberment of 17 males. Dahmer's crimes went beyond the horrific act of murder, many of his later victims were subjected to acts of necrophilia, cannibalism, and the macabre preservation of body parts, including the entire or partial skeletons. Psychiatric assessments diagnosed Dahmer with borderline personality disorder, BPD, schizotypal personality disorder, STPD, and a psychotic disorder. Despite these diagnoses, he was determined to be legally sane during his trial. In February 1992, Dahmer was convicted of 15 of the 16 homicides he had committed in Wisconsin. As a result, he received 15 consecutive life imprisonment sentences. Furthermore, Dahmer was sentenced to an additional life imprisonment term for another homicide he had committed in Ohio back in 1978, making it a total of 16 life sentences. However, on November 28, 1994, while incarcerated at the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin, Dahmer met a gruesome end himself. He was beaten to death by another inmate, Christopher Scarver, during an altercation within the prison. Jeffrey Dahmer's case remains one of the most chilling and disturbing in the annals of criminal history, leaving a lasting impact on the public's perception of serial killers and the criminal justice system. Early Life and Childhood Jeffrey Dahmer was born on May 21, 1960, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was the first of two sons born to his parents, Lionel Herbert Dahmer and Joyce Annette Dahmer, née Flint. Lionel, of German and Welsh ancestry, was a chemistry student at Marquette University who later became a research chemist. Joyce, of English, Norwegian, and Irish ancestry, worked as a teletype machine instructor. Dahmer's early childhood was marked by complex family dynamics. While some sources suggest that he may have been deprived of attention as an infant, others indicate that he was doted upon by both parents during his early years. His mother, Joyce, was known to be a hypochondriac who suffered from depression, demanding a great deal of attention and exhibiting signs of tension and argumentativeness, particularly with her husband and neighbors. As Dahmer began his education in first grade, his father's academic pursuits often kept him away from home, leaving Joyce in need of more attention. This situation led to an increased focus on her ailments, which subsequently impacted her interactions with her son. Dahmer's early years were characterized by family tension and arguments between his parents. He underwent double hernia surgery shortly before his fourth birthday, which appeared to have a lasting impact on his demeanor. At school, he was seen as a quiet and timid child, with teachers noting signs of abandonment due to his father's absence and his mother's illness. His mother's symptoms worsened during her second pregnancy. In 1966, the family moved to Doylestown, Ohio, where Dahmer's younger brother, David, was born. Lionel earned his degree and began working as an analytical chemist in nearby Akron, Ohio. It was during this time that Dahmer's fascination with dead animals emerged. His interest in animal bones began when he saw his father removing them from beneath their family home when he was just four years old. He referred to these bones as his fiddlesticks. Dahmer began searching for more bones around the house and collecting them. He also explored the bodies of live animals to understand their skeletal structures. In 1968, the family moved to Bath Township, Ohio, residing in their third home in just two years. This home had a small hut in the wooded area behind it, where Dahmer began collecting large insects and small animal skeletons, such as chipmunks and squirrels. He preserved some of these remains in jars of formaldehyde and stored them in the hut. Dahmer's interest in bones and preservation techniques expanded, and he later included roadkill in his collection. He dissected these animals and buried them near the hut, occasionally placing their skulls on makeshift crosses. His friend recalled that Dahmer was curious about how animals fit together. During this time, Dahmer's mother, Joyce, increasingly relied on medication, including equinol, laxatives, and sleeping pills, further isolating herself from her husband and children. This complex family environment and Dahmer's early fascination with dead animals played a role in his later disturbing behavior. Adolescence and High School From his freshman year at Revere High School, Dahmer was seen as an outcast. 
By age 14, he had begun drinking beer and hard alcohol in the daylight hours, frequently concealing his liquor inside the jacket he wore to school. Dahmer mentioned to one classmate who inquired why he was drinking scotch in a morning history class that the alcohol he consumed was my medicine. Although largely uncommunicative, in his freshman year, Dahmer was seen by staff as polite and highly intelligent but with average grades. He was a competitive tennis player and played briefly in the high school band. When he reached puberty, Dahmer discovered he was gay, he did not tell his parents. In his early teens, he had a brief relationship with another teenage boy, although they never had intercourse. By Dahmer's admission, he began fantasizing about dominating and controlling a completely submissive male partner in his early to mid-teens, and his masturbatory fantasies gradually evolved to his focusing on chests and torsos. These fantasies gradually became intertwined with dissection. When he was about 16, Dahmer conceived a fantasy of rendering unconscious a particular male jogger he found attractive, and then making sexual use of his body. On one occasion, Dahmer concealed himself in bushes with a baseball bat to lie in wait for this man. However, the jogger did not pass by on that particular day. Dahmer later admitted this was his first attempt to attack and render an individual submissive to him. Dahmer was seen by his high school peers as a class clown who often staged pranks, which became known as doing a Dahmer, these included bleeding and simulating epileptic seizures or cerebral palsy at school and local stores. Occasionally, Dahmer would perform these antics for money to purchase alcohol. By 1977, Dahmer's grades had declined. His parents hired a private tutor, with limited success. The same year, in an attempt to save their marriage, his parents attended counseling sessions. They continued to quarrel frequently. When Lionel discovered Joyce had engaged in a brief affair in September 1977, they decided to divorce, telling their sons they wished to do so amicably. The process of their divorce soon became increasingly bitter and acrimonious, and Lionel moved out of the house in early 1978, temporarily residing in a motel on North Cleveland Massillon Road. In May 1978, Dahmer graduated from high school. A few weeks before his graduation, one of his teachers observed Dahmer sitting close to the school car park, drinking several cans of beer, when the teacher threatened to report the matter. Dahmer informed him he was experiencing a lot of problems at home and that the school's guidance counselor was aware of them. That spring, Joyce, contrary to a court order and without informing Lionel, moved out of the family home with David to live with relatives in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Dahmer had just turned 18 and remained in the family home. Dahmer's parents' divorce was finalized on July 24, 1978. Joyce was awarded custody of her younger son and alimony payments. Murder of Stephen Hicks Dahmer's first known murder took place in 1978, shortly after his high school graduation. On June 18 of that year, Dahmer picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks, who was almost 19 years old. Hicks had been hitchhiking to a rock concert at Chippewa Lake Park, Ohio. Dahmer lured Hicks to his house under the pretext of having a few drinks. He promised Hicks a few beers, and since Dahmer had the house to himself, Hicks agreed to accompany him. Dahmer's sexual attraction to Hicks became evident as he noticed the young man standing bare-chested by the roadside. However, he knew that any sexual advances would likely be rejected if he mentioned them to Hicks, who was talking about girls. The two spent several hours talking, drinking, and listening to music. Hicks eventually expressed a desire to leave, but Dahmer did not want him to go. In a disturbing turn of events, Dahmer bludgeoned Hicks with a 10-pound dumbbell, striking him twice from behind as Hicks sat in a chair. After rendering Hicks unconscious, Dahmer strangled him to death with the bar of the dumbbell. Following the murder, Dahmer stripped Hicks' clothes off and explored his chest with his hands, later masturbating while standing above the lifeless body. Hours later, Dahmer moved the body to the basement. The following day, Dahmer dismembered Hicks' body in his basement. He then buried the remains in a shallow grave in his backyard. Several weeks later, he exhumed the remains and stripped the flesh from the bones. Dahmer dissolved the flesh in acid and flushed the solution down the toilet. He crushed the bones with a sledgehammer and scattered them in the woodland behind his family home. Additionally, he disposed of Hicks' necklace and the knife used in the dismemberment by throwing them from the West Bath Road Bridge into the Cuyahoga River. This gruesome and violent act marked the beginning of Dahmer's descent into serial murder and the horrific crimes that would follow. College and Army Service After the murder of Stephen Hicks, Dahmer's father and his fiancée returned to his home six weeks later, discovering that Dahmer was living alone. In August of that year, 
Dahmer enrolled at Ohio State University, OSU, with hopes of majoring in business. However, his time at OSU proved unproductive due to his persistent alcohol abuse. Dahmer received failing grades in several courses, including Introduction to Anthropology, Classical Civilizations, and Administrative Science. The only subject in which he achieved some success was riflery, earning a B-minus grade. His overall GPA was a mere 0.45 out of 4.0. During this period, Dahmer's alcohol addiction was evident, and his father made an unexpected visit to find his room filled with empty liquor bottles. Despite his father having already paid for the second term, Dahmer decided to drop out of OSU after just three months. In January 1979, Dahmer enlisted in the United States Army upon his father's urging. He underwent basic training at Fort McClellan in Anniston, Alabama, and later received training as a medical specialist at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. However, Dahmer's struggles with alcohol persisted during his time in the Army. He was occasionally reprimanded for intoxication, and an incident of insubordination led to a severe beating from fellow recruits. Dahmer was deployed to Baumholder, West Germany, on July 13, 1979, where he served as a combat medic in the 2nd Battalion, 68th Armored Regiment, 8th Infantry Division. In his first year of service, he was considered an average or slightly above-average soldier. As a result of his ongoing issues with alcohol, Dahmer's performance continued to deteriorate. In March 1981, he was deemed unsuitable for military service and subsequently discharged from the army. Despite his discharge, he received an honorable one, as his superiors did not believe that the problems Dahmer had exhibited in the army would apply to civilian life. On March 24, 1981, Dahmer was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for debriefing and provided with a plane ticket to go anywhere in the country. He chose to travel to Miami Beach, Florida, both because he wanted to escape the cold and to begin living independently. In Florida, he found a job at a delicatessen and rented a room in a nearby motel. His excessive alcohol consumption eventually led to eviction from the motel for non-payment. As a result, Dahmer spent his evenings on the beach, continuing to work at the sandwich shop. He eventually called his father and asked to return to Ohio in September of the same year, feeling he couldn't face returning home earlier. Return to Ohio and relocation to West Allis, Wisconsin. Upon returning to Ohio, Dahmer initially lived with his father and stepmother. In an attempt to keep him occupied, they delegated numerous chores to him while he searched for work. Despite their efforts, Dahmer continued to drink heavily, and two weeks after his return, he was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct. He was fined $60 and given a suspended 10-day jail sentence. His father attempted unsuccessfully to help him overcome his alcohol addiction. In December 1981, Dahmer's father and stepmother decided to send him to live with his grandmother in West Allis, Wisconsin. Dahmer displayed affection only toward his grandmother, and they hoped her influence, along with a change of location, might encourage him to quit drinking, find employment, and live responsibly. Initially, Dahmer's living arrangements with his grandmother were harmonious. He attended church with her, completed chores, actively searched for work, and adhered to most of her house rules, despite continuing to drink and smoke. In early 1982, he found employment as a phlebotomist at the Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center, holding the job for 10 months before being laid off. Dahmer remained unemployed for over two years, relying on the money his grandmother provided. Just before losing his job, he was arrested for indecent exposure at Wisconsin State Fair Park on August 8, 1982, and fined $50 plus court costs for the incident. In January 1985, Dahmer began working as a mixer at the Milwaukee Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, working from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. six nights a week with Saturday evenings off. Around this time, he was propositioned by a stranger at the West Allis Public Library. Although he didn't respond to the proposition, the incident triggered his fantasies of control and dominance. Dahmer began visiting Milwaukee's gay bars, bathhouses, and bookstores. By late 1985, Dahmer had become a regular visitor to bathhouses, finding them relaxing places. However, his sexual encounters became increasingly frustrating as he couldn't stand his partners moving during intercourse. To address this issue, he began administering sleeping pills to his partners by lacing their drinks with sedatives, waiting for them to fall asleep before engaging in sexual acts. Dahmer's father hired an attorney for him, 
and psychological evaluations found that he suffered from a schizoid personality disorder and had feelings of alienation and a lack of accomplishments in life. In January 1989, he pleaded guilty to charges of sexual assault and enticing a child for immoral purposes, and sentencing was scheduled for May. Two months before his sentencing, Dahmer murdered his fifth victim, Anthony Sears, a 24-year-old aspiring model, whom he met at a gay bar. Dahmer claimed he was not initially looking to commit a crime, but Sears approached him. Dahmer lured Sears to his grandmother's home, engaged in sexual activity, drugged him, and strangled him. Dahmer decapitated Sears, attempted to flay his corpse, stripped the flesh, and disposed of the remains. However, he preserved Sears' head and genitalia in acetone and stored them in a wooden box. On May 23, 1989, Dahmer was sentenced to five years probation and one year in the House of Correction, with work release permitted. He was also required to register as a sex offender. Two months before his scheduled release, he was paroled from this regimen and moved back to his grandmother's home in West Alice. 1990 Murders at the Oxford Apartments In 1990, after moving to the Oxford Apartments in Apartment 213, Dahmer committed several more murders. Raymond Smith, within one week of moving, Dahmer killed his sixth victim, Raymond Smith, a 32-year-old prostitute. Dahmer lured him with the promise of $50 for sex, drugged him, and manually strangled him. He then took suggestive Polaroid pictures of Smith's body before dismembering it in the bathroom. Dahmer disposed of most of Smith's remains but retained his skull, painting it and placing it alongside the skull of Anthony Sears in a filing cabinet. Incident with unnamed man, approximately one week later, Dahmer lured another man to his apartment, but he accidentally consumed the drug drink intended for his guest. The man stole several items, and Dahmer never reported the incident to the police. Edward Smith in June 1990, Dahmer lured a 27-year-old acquaintance, Edward Smith, to his apartment, where he drugged and strangled him. Dahmer placed Smith's skeleton in his freezer for several months in an attempt to remove moisture but later acidified the remains. Ernest Miller, less than three months after Edward Smith's murder, Dahmer encountered 22-year-old Ernest Miller. Dahmer offered him money for sex, drugged him, and then killed him by slashing his carotid artery. Dahmer posed Miller's body for photographs, dismembered it, and preserved the heart, liver, biceps, and flesh from the legs in his freezer. He boiled the rest of the body to retain the skeleton, which he bleached and preserved. David Thomas, three weeks after the murder of Ernest Miller, on September 24, 1990, Dahmer encountered David Thomas and lured him to his apartment with drinks and an offer for photographs. After giving Thomas a drug drink, Dahmer strangled him. This time, he retained no body parts, but he did photograph the dismemberment process. Between these murders, Dahmer occasionally attempted to lure men to his apartment unsuccessfully. He frequently reported feelings of anxiety, depression, and even suicidal thoughts to his probation officer, along with concerns about his sexuality, solitary lifestyle, and financial difficulties. Dahmer used this medication to incapacitate his partners, and he made false claims to doctors about his work schedule to maintain a supply of sedatives. After approximately 12 such instances, his bathhouse memberships were revoked, leading him to use hotel rooms for similar encounters. Following the revocation of his bathhouse memberships, Dahmer read a newspaper report about the upcoming funeral of an 18-year-old male. He conceived the idea of stealing the freshly interred corpse and bringing it home. He attempted to dig up the coffin but abandoned the plan due to the hard soil. On September 8, 1986, Dahmer was arrested for lewd and lascivious behavior for masturbating in the presence of two 12-year-old boys near the Kinnikinnick River. Initially, he claimed he had been urinating, unaware that there were witnesses, but he later admitted to the offense. The charge was changed to disorderly conduct, and on March 10, 1987, Dahmer was sentenced to one year of probation and instructed to undergo counseling. Late 20s and early 30s, subsequent murders, Ambassador Hotel. On November 20, 1987, Dahmer met a 25-year-old man named Stephen Twomey in a bar in Milwaukee. He convinced Twomey to return with him to the Ambassador Hotel, where Dahmer had rented a room for the night. Dahmer's initial intention was not to kill Twomey, but rather to drug him and explore his body. However, the next morning, Dahmer woke up to a gruesome scene. Twomey lay dead on the bed with a crushed chest and numerous bruises. Blood was seeping from the corner of his mouth, and Dahmer's fists and forearm were heavily bruised. Strangely, Dahmer claimed to have no memory of the murder and could not believe what had happened. 
Dahmer decided to dispose of Tuomi's body by purchasing a large suitcase. He transported Tuomi's body to his grandmother's residence, where he was living at the time. One week later, he began dismembering the body. Dahmer first severed the head, arms, and legs. He then filleted the flesh from the bones and cut it into small pieces for disposal, placing the flesh in plastic garbage bags. The bones were wrapped in a sheet and smashed into splinters with a sledgehammer. Dahmer disposed of all of Tuomi's remains, except for the head, in the trash. Dahmer retained Tuomi's head, wrapped in a blanket, for two weeks. Afterward, he boiled the head in a mixture of soylax, an alkali-based industrial detergent, and bleach in an attempt to preserve the skull. He used the skull as a stimulus for masturbation. However, this process made the skull brittle, and Dahmer eventually pulverized and disposed of it. Intermediate Murders Following the murder of Stephen Tuomi, Dahmer actively sought out victims, typically meeting them in or around gay bars. He would lure them to his grandmother's home, drug them, engage in sexual activity, and then strangle them once they were unconscious. Two months after Tuomi's murder, Dahmer encountered a 14-year-old Native American prostitute, James Dockstader. He lured Dockstader to his grandmother's residence, offered him money to pose for nude pictures, and then drugged and strangled him. Dahmer dismembered the body and disposed of it, retaining the skull for a brief period before pulverizing it. In March 1988, Dahmer met Richard Guerrero, a 22-year-old man, outside a gay bar. He lured Guerrero to his grandmother's residence, drugged him, strangled him, and engaged in sexual acts with the corpse. Dahmer dismembered Guerrero's body and retained the skull, which he later pulverized. In April 1988, Dahmer attempted to drug and kill Ronald Flowers Jr., but his grandmother's presence interrupted the act. Dahmer's escalating crimes and his behavior, including late-night visits from young men and foul odors, prompted his grandmother to ask him to move out. He found a one-bedroom apartment and moved there in September 1988. However, two days after moving, he was arrested for drugging and fondling a 13-year-old boy he had lured to his home on the pretext of posing nude for photographs. 1991 Murders In 1991, Dahmer continued his gruesome spree of murders and dismemberments. Curtis Strotter, in February 1991, Dahmer lured 17-year-old Curtis Strotter into his apartment with the promise of money for posing for nude photos. After drugging him and cuffing his hands, Dahmer strangled Strotter. He retained Strotter's skull, hands, and genitals and photographed each stage of the dismemberment process. Errol Lindsay, in April 1991, Dahmer lured 19-year-old Errol Lindsay to his apartment drugged him, and then drilled a hole in his skull, injecting hydrochloric acid. When Lindsay awoke, Dahmer drugged and strangled him. Dahmer retained Lindsay's skull. Tony Hughes, on May 24, 1991, Dahmer encountered 31-year-old Tony Hughes at a nightclub. He lured Hughes to his apartment with the promise of money for photos. Dahmer drugged him and injected hydrochloric acid into his skull in an attempt to render him submissive. The drilling and injection, however, proved fatal. Conorac Synthesumphone, on May 26, 1991, Dahmer encountered 14-year-old Conorac Synthesumphone. Unbeknownst to Dahmer, Synthesumphone was the younger brother of a victim he had previously molested. Dahmer lured Synthesumphone to his apartment, drugged him, and injected hydrochloric acid into his skull. Synthesumphone briefly awoke, unaware of his surroundings. When the police were called, Dahmer convinced them that Synthesumphone was his adult lover who had merely drunk too much. Matt Turner, on June 30, 1991, Dahmer encountered 20-year-old Matt Turner at a bus station in Chicago. Turner agreed to a photo shoot and traveled to Milwaukee. Dahmer drugged, strangled, and dismembered Turner, retaining his head and internal organs. Jeremiah Weinberger, on July 5, 1991, Dahmer lured 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger from a Chicago bar to his apartment. He drugged Weinberger and injected boiling water into his skull causing him to fall into a coma from which he died two days later. Oliver Lacey, on July 15, 1991, Dahmer lured 24-year-old Oliver Lacey to his apartment after promising nude photos. He drugged Lacey and had tentative sexual activity with him before strangling him. Dahmer kept Lacey's head and heart in the refrigerator and his skeleton in the freezer. Joseph Braidhoft, after being dismissed from his job on July 19, 1991, Dahmer lured 25-year-old Joseph Braidhoft to his apartment. Dahmer strangled Braidhoft, and after leaving the body on his bed for two days, he decapitated it. 
Dahmer cleaned the head and placed it in the refrigerator. He also acidified Braidhoff's torso, along with those of two other victims killed within the previous month. Throughout these murders, Dahmer engaged in horrific acts, experimenting on some victims, and photographing the dismemberment process. His actions became increasingly gruesome and depraved as he continued to kill. Arrest and Capture On July 22, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer's murderous spree came to an end when he approached three men, offering $100 for their company at his apartment. One of the men, Tracy Edwards, agreed to accompany Dahmer. After entering Dahmer's apartment, Edwards noticed a foul odor and boxes of hydrochloric acid. When Dahmer cuffed his wrist, Edwards asked about his intentions. Dahmer brandished a knife, informed Edwards he intended to take nude pictures of him, and later mentioned he wanted to eat his heart. Edwards cleverly suggested going to the bathroom and calmly asked to sit in the living room with air conditioning. When Dahmer agreed, Edwards waited for a moment of distraction, then punched Dahmer and fled from the apartment. Edwards flagged down two police officers, explaining that a freak had handcuffed him. The officers observed the handcuff and accompanied Edwards back to Dahmer's apartment. Inside, they found Dahmer, who admitted to handcuffing Edwards without providing a reason. Edwards also revealed that Dahmer had threatened him with a knife. Dahmer willingly led the officers to his bedroom where the handcuff key was located. However, the officers made a shocking discovery, Polaroid pictures of dismembered human bodies. When they saw the photos, they arrested Dahmer. A further search of his apartment unveiled four severed heads in the kitchen, multiple skulls, body parts in the refrigerator, a container with human organs, and several more dismembered torsos in a drum filled with acid. Dahmer was taken into custody, and his gruesome crimes were finally exposed. The Milwaukee police described the apartment as a gruesome museum of horrors, and the chief medical examiner compared it to dismantling someone's museum rather than processing a crime scene. Confession. Beginning in the early hours of July 23, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer was questioned by Detective Patrick Kennedy and later by Detective Dennis Murphy regarding the murders he had committed and the evidence found in his apartment. During more than 60 hours of combined interviews over the following two weeks, Dahmer confessed to his horrific crimes. He willingly waived his right to have an attorney present throughout his interrogations, stating he wished to confess everything to put an end to the horror he had created. Dahmer admitted to having murdered 16 young men in Wisconsin since 1987, with one additional victim, Stephen Hicks, killed in Ohio in 1978. Most of his victims had been rendered unconscious before their murder, with some dying due to having acid or boiling water injected into their brains. Dahmer also confessed to engaging in necrophilia with some of his victims' bodies, often performing sexual acts with their viscera as he dismembered them. Dahmer explained that he had consumed body parts of his victims out of curiosity, and in a disturbing manner, he stated, I suppose, in an odd way, it made me feel they were even more a permanent part of me. He also described his increasing compulsion to kill in the two months before his arrest, stating that it was an incessant and never-ending desire that filled his thoughts all day long. Dahmer's plans for the future included constructing an altar made from the skulls of his victims. He intended to display it in his living room, adorned with the complete skeletons of two of his victims. The altar would be used for meditation, a place where he felt at home and drew a sense of power. It was intended to be his own private and horrifying sanctuary. These detailed confessions provided a chilling glimpse into the mind of a serial killer, leading to his eventual conviction and imprisonment. Indictment On July 25, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer was initially charged with four counts of first-degree murder in Wisconsin. As the investigation continued and more evidence came to light, he was subsequently charged with 11 more murders committed in Wisconsin by August 22. Furthermore, on September 14, 1991, evidence found in Ohio led to authorities formally identifying two molars and a vertebra as belonging to his first victim, Stephen Hicks. Consequently, Dahmer was charged with Hicks's murder by Ohio authorities three days later. It's important to note that Dahmer was not charged with the attempted murder of Tracy Edwards, nor with the murder of Stephen Twomey. He was not charged with Twomey's murder because the Milwaukee County District Attorney only brought charges where murder could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. In the case of Twomey, Dahmer had no memory of committing the murder, and there was no physical evidence to support it. Dahmer's case took a significant turn when, at a scheduled preliminary hearing on January 13, 1992, he pleaded guilty but insane to 15 counts of murder, marking a crucial phase in the legal proceedings against him. Trial 
Jeffrey Dahmer's trial began on January 30, 1992, in Milwaukee. He faced 15 counts of first-degree murder for his heinous crimes. By pleading guilty earlier on January 13, he had waived his right to a trial to establish his guilt. During the trial, there were debates about whether Dahmer suffered from a mental or personality disorder. The prosecution argued that any disorders he may have had did not deprive him of the ability to understand the criminality of his actions or resist his impulses. In contrast, the defense argued that Dahmer suffered from a mental disease, driven by obsessions and impulses he couldn't control. Dahmer's defense experts argued that he was insane due to his necrophilic drive or his compulsion to have sexual encounters with corpses. They claimed that he couldn't conform his conduct due to this condition. The defense also argued that he had borderline personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, alcohol dependence, and a psychotic disorder. On the prosecution side, experts testified that Dahmer was not insane at the time of the murders. They argued that he was a calculating and cunning individual who could distinguish right from wrong and control his actions. One of the prosecution witnesses, forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz, believed that Dahmer's actions were not impulsive but premeditated. The court also heard from court-appointed mental health professionals who gave their opinions independently of the prosecution and defense. They diagnosed Dahmer with various personality disorders but still deemed him legally sane. The trial provided a detailed look into Dahmer's mental state and motivations, and it was a critical part of the legal proceedings against him. Closing Arguments The trial of Jeffrey Dahmer lasted for two weeks, and on February 14, both attorneys presented their closing arguments to the jury. Each attorney was given two hours for their closing statements. Defense attorney Gerald Boyle argued first. He repeatedly referred to the testimony of mental health professionals, most of whom had agreed that Dahmer was afflicted with a mental disease. Boyle's argument revolved around the idea that Dahmer's compulsive killings were a result of a sickness he didn't choose but rather discovered. He portrayed Dahmer as a profoundly lonely and desperately sick individual who was so out of control that he could not conform his conduct anymore. Following Boyle's 75-minute closing argument, Michael McCann, the prosecutor, delivered his closing argument. McCann presented Dahmer as a sane man who was in full control of his actions and simply sought to avoid detection. He described Dahmer as a calculating individual who killed to control his victims and retain their bodies to prolong his period of sexual pleasure. McCann argued that by pleading guilty but insane to the charges, Dahmer was trying to escape responsibility for his crimes. Conviction On February 15, the court announced its verdict. Jeffrey Dahmer was found to be sane and not suffering from a mental disorder at the time of each of the 15 murders for which he was tried. It's worth noting that two of the 12 jurors in each count dissented from this verdict. Formal sentencing was scheduled for February 17. On that day, Dahmer addressed the court. In his statement, he expressed that he had never desired freedom since his arrest and that he frankly wished for his own death. He emphasized that none of his murders were motivated by hatred and that he understood nothing he said or did could undo the harm he had caused to the victims' families and the city of Milwaukee. Dahmer claimed that he and his doctors believed his criminal behavior was motivated by mental disorders and that this understanding had given him some peace. He acknowledged that society would never forgive him but hoped that God would. He concluded by saying he knew his time in prison would be terrible, but he deserved whatever he got for his actions. He asked for no consideration. Dahmer was then sentenced to life imprisonment plus 10 years for the first two counts. The remaining 13 counts carried a mandatory sentence of life imprisonment plus 70 years. Capital punishment was not an option because Wisconsin had abolished the death penalty in 1853. After the sentencing, Dahmer's father and stepmother were allowed a 10-minute private meeting with him before he was transferred to the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage to begin his sentence. They exchanged hugs and well wishes before Dahmer was escorted away. Three months after his conviction in Milwaukee, Dahmer was extradited to Ohio to be tried for the murder of his first victim, Stephen Hicks. In a brief court hearing lasting just 45 minutes, Dahmer again pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to a 16th term of life imprisonment on May 1, 1992. Imprisonment After his sentencing, Jeffrey Dahmer was transferred to the Columbia Correctional Institution. Due to concerns for his safety, he was placed in solitary confinement for the first year of his incarceration. During this time, he received numerous letters and donations from people around the world, which he used to purchase items like cassette recordings, stationery, cigarettes, and magazines. 
Dahmer requested a transfer to a less secure unit after a year in solitary confinement. In the new unit, he had a daily two-hour work detail cleaning the toilet block, which later expanded to include cleaning the prison gymnasium. In 1991, after completing his confessions, Dahmer requested a copy of the Bible. He began studying Christianity and eventually became a born-again Christian. He was baptized in May 1994 by Roy Ratcliffe, a minister from the Church of Christ, in the prison whirlpool. Ratcliffe visited Dahmer regularly to discuss various topics, including the concept of death. Dahmer's transformation was notable, and he stated in interviews that his newfound faith gave him a sense of accountability for his actions. In an interview with Stone Phillips on Dateline NBC, Dahmer said, If a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. On July 3, 1994, another inmate, Osvaldo Deruthi, attempted to harm Dahmer by slashing his throat with a razor embedded in a toothbrush. Dahmer received only superficial wounds and was not seriously injured. He had expressed his readiness to die and accept any punishment while in prison. His family maintained regular contact with him, including his mother, Joyce, who had not seen him since 1983. In their weekly phone calls, Dahmer would respond to her concerns for his well-being with comments like, It doesn't matter, Mom. I don't care if something happens to me. Death. On the morning of November 28, 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer left his cell to conduct his assigned work detail. He was accompanied by two fellow inmates, Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver. The three were left unsupervised in the showers of the prison gym for about 20 minutes. During this time, Dahmer was discovered on the bathroom floor, suffering from severe head wounds. He had been bludgeoned with a 20-inch metal bar and had also had his head repeatedly struck against the wall. Although still alive, he was rushed to a nearby hospital, where he was pronounced dead one hour later. Anderson, who was with Dahmer during the attack, was also beaten with the same instrument and died from his wounds two days later. Christopher Scarver, who was serving a life sentence for a murder he committed in 1990, confessed to the attacks. He informed authorities that he had attacked Dahmer with the metal bar while Dahmer was cleaning a staff locker room and had then attacked Anderson while he was cleaning an inmate locker room. Scarver stated that Dahmer did not yell or make any noise during the attack. Afterward, Scarver returned to his cell and informed a prison guard, saying, God told me to do it. Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. Scarver claimed that the attacks were not premeditated, but he had concealed the iron bar in his clothing shortly before carrying them out. Upon hearing of Dahmer's death, his mother, Joyce, responded angrily to the media. The response from the families of Dahmer's victims was mixed, with some celebrating the news and others feeling sadness and continued pain. In May 1995, Christopher Scarver was sentenced to two additional terms of life imprisonment for the murders of Dahmer and Anderson. Dahmer's will stated that he wished for no services to be conducted and that he wanted to be cremated. In September 1995, Dahmer's body was cremated, and his ashes were divided between his parents. There was initially a disagreement between his parents about whether his brain should be retained for medical research, but the organ was later cremated in December 1995. Aftermath The revelation of Jeffrey Dahmer's heinous crimes had a significant impact on Milwaukee and various communities involved. Here are some key points about the aftermath. Community healing. On August 5, 1991, a candlelight vigil was held in Milwaukee, attended by more than 400 people, including community leaders, gay rights activists, and victims' family members. The purpose of the vigil was to share feelings of pain and anger and promote healing. Racial tensions. Milwaukee was experiencing heightened racial tensions during the time of Dahmer's murders. News of the murders and the conduct of some police officers in relation to one victim, Conorak Synthesumphone, exacerbated these tensions. Impact on Milwaukee's gay community Milwaukee's gay community, which was relatively underground and transient at the time, became nervous and distrusting of others after Dahmer's crimes were revealed. The fear and distrust generated by his actions were, however, short-lived. Demolition of the Oxford Apartments The Oxford Apartments at 924 North 25th Street, where Dahmer committed many of his murders, were demolished in November 1992. The site remains vacant. Disposition of Dahmer's estate. Dahmer's estate was awarded to the families of 11 of his victims who sued for damages. Some of his possessions were destroyed and buried in an undisclosed Illinois landfill. This process was facilitated by the Milwaukee Civic Pride Group, 
which raised funds for the purpose. Lionel Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer's father, Lionel Dahmer, remained in the public eye, publishing a book titled A Father's Story in 1994. He donated a portion of the book's proceeds to the victims' families. Lionel and his second wife, Sherry, did not change their surname and continued to support their son. They professed their love for Jeffrey in spite of his crimes. Joyce Flint, Dahmer's mother, Joyce Flint, passed away in 2000 from cancer. Prior to her death, she had attempted suicide at least once. David Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer's younger brother, David, changed his surname and chose to live in anonymity. The heinous nature of Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes left a lasting impact on both the families of the victims and the community at large. The case remains one of the most notorious in the history of criminal psychology. Victims Jeffrey Dahmer killed 17 young men between 1978 and 1991. Twelve were killed in his North 25th Street apartment. Three victims were murdered and dismembered at his grandmother's West Allis residence. His first and second victims were murdered at his parents' home in Ohio and at the Ambassador Hotel in Milwaukee, respectively. A total of 14 of Dahmer's victims were from various ethnic minority backgrounds, with nine victims being black. Dahmer was adamant that the race of his victims was incidental to him and that it was the body form of a potential victim that attracted his attention. These contentions have been supported via an independent forensic specialist study of Dahmer's victim selection, the anthropological analysis of which revealed his victims shared a morphological similarity and suggesting Dahmer was psychologically attracted to a certain anthropometric body type. Most of Dahmer's victims were killed by strangulation after being drugged with sedatives. His first victim was killed by a combination of bludgeoning and strangulation and his second victim was battered to death with one further victim killed in 1990, Ernest Miller, dying of a combination of shock and blood loss due to his carotid artery being cut. Four of Dahmer's victims killed in 1991 had holes bored into their skulls through which Dahmer injected hydrochloric acid or, later, boiling water, into the frontal lobes in an attempt to induce a permanent, submissive, unresistant state. This proved fatal, although on each occasion this was not Dahmer's intention. 1978. June 18, Stephen Mark Hicks, 18. Last seen hitchhiking to a rock concert in Chippewa Lake Park in Bath, Ohio. By Dahmer's admission, Hicks caught his attention because he was bare-chested. He was bludgeoned with a dumbbell and strangled to death with this instrument before being dismembered. Remains pulverized and scattered in woodland behind Dahmer's family home. 1987. November 20, Stephen Walter Twomey, 25. Killed in a rented room at the Ambassador Hotel in Milwaukee. Dahmer claimed to have no memory of murdering Twomey, yet stated he must have battered him to death in a drunken stupor. His body was dismembered in the basement of Dahmer's grandmother's house and the remains discarded in the trash. No remains were ever found. 1988. January 16, James Edward Dockstater, 14. Met Dahmer outside a gay bar in Wisconsin. Doc Stater was lured to West Alice on the pretext of earning $50 for posing for nude pictures. Dahmer strangled Doc Stater and kept his body in the basement for a week before dismembering him and discarding the remains in the trash. No remains were ever found. March 24, Richard Guerrero, 22. Drugged and strangled in Dahmer's bedroom at West Alice. Dahmer dismembered Guerrero's corpse in the basement, dissolved the flesh in acid, and disposed of the bones in the trash. He bleached and retained the skull for several months before disposing of it. No remains were ever found. 1989. March 25, Anthony Lee Sears, 24. Sears was the last victim to be drugged and strangled at Dahmer's grandmother's residence, he was also the first victim from whom Dahmer permanently retained any body parts. His preserved skull and genitals were found in a filing cabinet at 924 North 25th Street following Dahmer's arrest in 1991. 1990. May 20, Raymond Lamont Smith, also known as Ricky Beeks, 32. The first victim to be killed at Dahmer's North 25th Street apartment. Smith was a male sex worker whom Dahmer encountered at a tavern. Dahmer gave Smith a drink laced with sleeping pills, then strangled him on his kitchen floor. His skull was spray-painted and retained. June 14, Edward Warren Smith, 27. A known acquaintance of Dahmer who was last seen in his company at a party. Dahmer acidified Smith's skeleton, his skull was destroyed unintentionally when placed in the oven in an effort to remove moisture. No remains were ever found. September 2, Ernest Marquez Miller, 22. 
Miller was a dance student whom Dahmer encountered outside a bookstore. According to Dahmer, he was especially attracted to Miller's physique. He was killed by having his carotid artery severed before being dismembered in the bathtub, with Dahmer storing his entire skeleton in the bottom drawer of a filing cabinet and his heart, liver, biceps, and portions of his thighs in the freezer for later consumption. September 24, David Courtney Thomas, 22, encountered Dahmer near the Grand Avenue Mall. He was lured to Dahmer's apartment on the promise of money for posing nude. Once a lace drink had rendered Thomas unconscious, Dahmer decided he wasn't my type. Nonetheless, Dahmer strangled Thomas, taking Polaroid photos of the dismemberment process. No remains were ever found. 1991. February 18, Curtis Durrell Strader, 17. Approached by Dahmer as he waited at a bus stop near Marquette University. Dahmer lured Strader to his apartment, where he drugged, handcuffed and strangled him before dismembering his body in the bathtub. He retained Strader's skull, hands, and genitals. April 7, Errol Lindsay, 19. The first victim upon whom Dahmer practiced what he later described to investigators as his drilling technique, a procedure in which he drilled holes into the victim's skull, through which he injected hydrochloric acid into the brain. According to Dahmer, Lindsay awoke after this practice, after which he was again rendered unconscious with a drink laced with sedatives, then strangled to death. Dahmer flayed Lindsay's body and retained the skin for several weeks. His skull was found following Dahmer's arrest. May 24, Tony Anthony Hughes, 31. Hughes was lured by Dahmer to his apartment upon the promise of posing nude for photographs. As Hughes was deaf, he and Dahmer communicated using handwritten notes. The injection of hydrochloric acid into Hughes's skull proved fatal. His body was left on Dahmer's bedroom floor for three days before being dismembered, with Dahmer photographing the dismemberment process. His skull was retained and identified from dental records. May 27, Connor X and the Sumphone, 14. The younger brother of the boy Dahmer had assaulted in 1988. Synthesumphone was drugged and had hydrochloric acid injected into his brain before Dahmer left him unattended as he left the apartment to purchase beer. When he returned, he discovered Synthesumphone naked and disoriented in the street, with three distressed young women attempting to assist him. When police arrived, Dahmer persuaded them he and Synthesumphone were lovers and that Synthesumphone was simply intoxicated. When police left Synthesumphone with Dahmer in his apartment, Dahmer again injected hydrochloric acid into Synthesumphone's brain, and this proved fatal. His head was retained in the freezer and his body dismembered. June 30, Matt Cleveland Turner, 20. On June 30, Dahmer attended the Chicago Pride Parade. At a bus stop, he encountered a 20-year-old named Matt Turner and persuaded him to accompany him to Milwaukee to pose for a photo shoot. Turner was drugged, strangled, and then dismembered in the bathtub. His head and internal organs were put in the freezer and his torso was subsequently placed in the 57-gallon drum Dahmer purchased on July 12. July 5, Jeremiah Benjamin Weinberger, 23, met Dahmer at a gay bar in Chicago and agreed to accompany him to Milwaukee for the weekend. Dahmer drilled through Weinberger's skull and injected boiling water into the cavity. He later recalled Weinberger's death to be exceptional, as he was the only victim who died with his eyes open. Weinberger's decapitated body was kept in the bathtub for a week before being dismembered, his torso was placed in the 57-gallon drum. July 15, Oliver Joseph Lacey, 24. A bodybuilding enthusiast whom Dahmer enticed to his apartment on the promise of money for posing for photographs. Lacey was drugged and strangled with a leather strap before being decapitated, with his head and heart being placed in the refrigerator. His skeleton was retained to adorn one side of the private shrine of skulls and skeletons Dahmer was in the process of creating when arrested one week later. July 19, Joseph Arthur Braidhoft, 25. Dahmer's last victim. Braidhoft was a father of three children from Minnesota who was looking for work in Milwaukee at the time of his murder. He was left on Dahmer's bed for two days following his murder before, on July 21, being decapitated. His head was placed in the refrigerator and his torso in the 57-gallon drum. The media mentions you provided are related to the life and crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer, a notorious American serial killer. Here's a brief overview of the films and documentaries you mentioned. The Secret Life, Jeffrey Dahmer, 1993. Directed by David Bowen. A biographical crime drama that stars Carl Crew as Jeffrey Dahmer. Dahmer, 2002. This biographical film stars Jeremy Renner in the title role, portraying Jeffrey Dahmer. 
Bruce Davison plays the role of Dahmer's father, Lionel. Raising Jeffrey Dahmer, 2006. A drama film that revolves around the reactions of Dahmer's parents following his arrest in 1991. Rusty Sneary plays the role of Dahmer, while Scott Cordes portrays Lionel, Dahmer's father. The Jeffrey Dahmer Files, 2012. An independent documentary that premiered at the South by Southwest Festival. It features interviews with individuals such as Dahmer's former neighbor, Pamela Bass, Detective Patrick Kennedy, and the city medical examiner Jeffrey Jensen. My Friend Dahmer, 2017. Directed by Mark Myers and based on the graphic novel by John Bachdorf. The film stars Ross Lynch as Jeffrey Dahmer and focuses on his high school years and the events leading up to his first murder. This film provides a unique perspective on Dahmer's life before his infamous crimes. These works explore different aspects of Jeffrey Dahmer's life, crimes, and the impact he had on those around him. They offer varying perspectives and interpretations of his story, ranging from biographical dramas to documentaries and even a unique take on his high school years. Here is a list of books related to Jeffrey Dahmer and his crimes. Inside the Mind of Jeffrey Dahmer, The Cannibal Killer, 2022, by Christopher Barry D. This book delves into the mind of Jeffrey Dahmer and explores the psychology of the infamous cannibal killer. A Father's Story, 1994, by Lionel Dahmer. Lionel Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer's father, wrote this book to share his perspective and tell the story from a father's point of view. Milwaukee Massacre, Jeffrey Dahmer and the Milwaukee Murders, 1992, by Robert J. Dvorak and Lisa Holwa. This book provides an account of the crimes and murders committed by Jeffrey Dahmer in Milwaukee. Minds on Trial, Great Cases in Law and Psychology, 2006, by Charles Patrick Ewing and Joseph T. McCann. While this book covers various legal cases, it likely includes a section on the legal and psychological aspects of the Jeffrey Dahmer case. Murderous Minds, Exploring the Criminal Psychopathic Brain, Neurological Imaging and the Manifestation of Evil, 2014, by Dean A. Haycock. This book explores the neurological aspects of criminal psychopathy and may include a discussion of cases like Dahmer's. Dark Journey, Deep Grace, Jeffrey Dahmer's Story of Faith, 2006, by Roy Ratcliffe and Lindy Adams. This book offers insight into Jeffrey Dahmer's faith and his religious journey during his incarceration. Jeffrey Dahmer, A Terrifying True Story of Rape, Murder and Cannibalism, 2017, by Jack Rosewood. This book likely provides a detailed account of Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes and their horrifying nature. These books offer various perspectives on Jeffrey Dahmer, including insights into his crimes, psychology, family perspective, faith, and the legal aspects of his case. Readers interested in true crime and criminology may find these books informative and thought-provoking. Here's a list of television programs and theatrical works related to Jeffrey Dahmer. Television Programs the Trial of Jeffrey Dahmer, 1992. A documentary directed by Elkin Allen, focusing on the testimony delivered during Dahmer's first trial. The documentary concludes with Dahmer's address to Judge Lawrence Graham following his conviction. Dahmer, Mystery of a Serial Killer, November 1993. Directed by Michael Hussein and released by a &E Networks. Contains archive footage of Dahmer's trial and interviews with individuals, including forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz. Inside Edition Interview, January 1993. Conducted by reporter Nancy Glass and broadcast in February 1993, this 30-minute interview with Dahmer offers insights into his perspective. ABC News Day 1 Episode, April 1993. ABC News produced a one-hour episode focusing on Dahmer's crimes as part of their television news magazine series Day 1. It features interviews with forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz and psychiatrist Fred Berlin. To Kill and Kill Again, December 12, 1993. A Channel 4 documentary that focuses on the murders committed by Jeffrey Dahmer. Confessions of a Serial Killer, March 8, 1994. A 90-minute episode of Dateline NBC, conducted by Stone Phillips. It features interviews with Dahmer and his father at the Columbia Correctional Institution and an interview with Dahmer's mother. Everyman, Profile of a Serial Killer, November 1994 a 50-minute documentary by the BBC, directed by Nikki Stockley, that focuses on the life and crimes of Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, The Monster Within, June 1996. A 50-minute documentary by a &E Networks, featuring interviews with Detective Patrick Kennedy and Prosecutor Michael McCann. Born to Kill? 
episode, October 2005. Part of the British true crime series Born to Kill? This 45-minute episode features interviews with FBI criminal profiler Robert Ressler and Detective Patrick Kennedy. Most Evil Documentary, August 2006. A documentary within the Investigation Discovery series Most Evil featuring excerpts from Dahmer's 1994 Dateline NBC interview with Stone Phillips. How It Really Happened episode, March 31, 2017. An HLN episode titled The Strange Case of Jeffrey Dahmer explores Dahmer's crimes as part of its investigative series. Dark Tourist, July 20, 2018. An episode of the Netflix Dark Tourism documentary series that features Dahmer's crimes. Jeffrey Dahmer, Mind of a Monster, May 2020. A documentary commissioned by the Investigation Discovery Channel featuring interviews with Dahmer's father, former neighbors, eyewitnesses, investigators, and forensic psychiatrists. Dahmer, Monster, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story, September 21, 2022. A 10-part biographical crime drama series commissioned by Netflix, with Evan Peters portraying Jeffrey Dahmer. Conversations with a Killer, the Jeffrey Dahmer Tapes, October 7, 2022. Commissioned by Netflix and directed by Joe Berlinger, this series includes previously unreleased recordings of conversations between Dahmer and his attorneys. Theatrical Works. The Law of Remains, 1992. Written and directed by experimental artist Reza Abdo, this play uses the techniques of Artaud's Theater of Cruelty to depict the life and crimes of Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, Guilty But Insane, 2013. Written and performed by Joshua Hitchens and directed by Ryan Walter, this theatrical performance explores Dahmer's life and crimes. These television programs and theatrical works provide various perspectives and interpretations of Jeffrey Dahmer's life, crimes, and the impact he had on society.